Hey, Doc audience, there's 40 million women globally with breast implants. New Beauty just came out with an article that I, I saw it caught my attention. It was, it, the title was, what happens when an implant ruptures? Is it an emergency? And I think you can think 40 million women with implants, there's probably quite a few of those implants that have the same question. Implant rupture has always been, number one, the word is misleading. It's not an explosion or any major event. In, in fact, it could be a little pinhole you can barely see, but it's basically a, a defect or failure of the shell of the implant. And then, then we have a, another direct message from a patient, a breast reconstruction patient that it basically relates, had something evaluated in her breast. She found out she had an implant rupture. She subsequently said she found out that she was supposed to be getting routine surveillance of her implants, but she hadn't been told that. So I think that that sometimes happens and patients may not know what's recommended. So let's break this down. Let's get uh, these questions answered. And I think we're going to go back to the history of the really silicone breast implant because that's where it all starts. So I'll, we'll go back to many years ago, 33 years ago, 1991, 92. That was what was called the silicone breast implant moratorium. That was when the FDA did a, a brief cessation in the use of silicone gel breast implants. And it was surrounding these different claims, many unsubstantiated claims of whether or not silicone implants cause systemic disease, specifically autoimmune diseases, things like that. Well, the issue then, which is, is not, not really a current issue, um, but there wasn't a lot of data in 1990. And so what was decided was the usage of the implants would continue under uh, special access studies. Breast reconstruction patients still had access. Patients that were deemed more appropriate to get silicone, say, than saline implants were able to get those implants. But clinical trials were started, and there were many clinical trials. And through those clinical trials, then the implants were ultimately reapproved by the FDA in 2006. In 2005 and 6, one of the big questions was, well, how long do these implants last? And the thing about the, the clinical trials is that even though they're 10 year studies generally, at, at the time, of those presentations, they're not done. So they're, they're basically made three, four, or five years sometimes into the trial. And so one of the things that was done was called Kaplan-Meier evaluation. And, and where they did is they looked at the data in that study, because obviously, you know, and you, it's these, these advisory committee means you have lots of different stakeholders. You obviously have a big faction of anti-implant people, you have pro-implant people, you have, and those are patients. And then you have academicians, scientists, uh, you have plastic surgeons, you have other doctors, you have industry advocacy groups. So there's lots of different people that come with this Kaplan-Meier evaluation. Basically in 2005, there was uh, two companies presenting their data, and that was Allergan and Mentor and they present separately. And then actually the committee, the advisory committee meets um, publicly and then they vote whether they would uh, approve the PMA or, or recommend not approving the PMA. And uh, if my memory serves me accurately, so Allergan basically missed, uh, we got out, was outvoted initially by one vote. It was solely because they, they were not able to explain that question about how long does the implant last. The next day, Mentor presented their data and they had a little different tactic and they were able to do this, this Kaplan-Meier evaluation in, in, a, in a more granular, illustrative way. And what they showed was over time that, that the, the rupture rate of a silicone gel brush cement would be 1% per year. And so 1% per year has been something that's been out there and ultimately Allergan represented their data a year later and, and ultimately both of those companies had PMA approval of their silicone gel breast implants. One of the recommendations that came out of the 2005 and 2006 uh, advisory committee meeting was the follow-up for breast implant patients and surveillance was important. So in the labeling, which is kind of the end uh, recommendation by the FDA to the manufacturers, the labeling was that women should get an MRI at three years and every other year after that. But there's a lot of issues with MRI. Well, MRI is a great 
technology, but for breast implants, it has uh, fairly high false positive rates. But the biggest problem, and this is what we learned, we knew this five years into the study in 2011. And a matter of fact, I presented um, on this. I presented on the utility of ultrasound. In, in 2010 onward, we were really getting more experience and starting to generate data. And I recommended that the FDA recognized ultrasound as a surveillance technology because at the time, MRI was the only surveillance tool. No patients, well, I shouldn't say no, but very, very few patients were doing MRI because it's difficult, it's expensive, it, it wasn't user friendly. It just, there's a lot of reasons for that. Unfortunately, in 2011, no further recommendations came out. Um, but the, the, the big thing was, um, in 2019. At that time, the FDA panel, and one of the recommendations was actually that they drop MRI as a surveillance modality and add high resolution ultrasound. It, ultimately, the FDA takes all that and then comes out what they're labeling. So in their labeling, what they did is they just added ultrasound as an accepted surveillance technology, which is, has been an incredible advance in, in what we're talking about for rupture, because in terms of implant surveillance, if, if you're a breast implant patient, my expert recommendation to you is you just you need to follow your implants. So you need to be going back and, and getting follow-up with your plastic surgeon, but also you need to have some way to, to truly follow those implants. And the best way to surveillance the implant is with ultrasound. We just are publishing a study now that shows our, our 10 year experience with, um, actually it's longer than 10 years, up to 20 year experience with ultrasound, with implant surveillance. And what we found in that study was that at, at 10 years, 98% of the implants were intact, uh, and, and at 15 years, about 88 uh, to 90% of the implants were intact. It looks like what the scientists presented in 2005 and 2006, 1% per year rupture, is, it's probably about right. Maybe, maybe it's a little bit more favorable in the real world data, and, and there's more data than our study that actually would corroborate this, but it's about 1% per year. So that means if you have a breast implant for 15 years, there's a, maybe a 15% chance that it has a leak or a rupture and an 85% chance that it's in t intact. And so, you know, I, I usually tell patients like, that, those are pretty. Those are pretty good odds. I do recommend people uh, do an ultrasound. We usually have people do an ultrasound every five years um, um, if they're asymptomatic and doing well, or we do an ultrasound basically as part of their evaluation if they have any kind of issue. You know, the one thing is the silicone breast implants, the newer generation implants. That's really the generation four implants, which are really 1993 onward. Generation four or five and generation six silicone gel breast implants generally are far more durable than the older second generation implants. So the devices now are different, they're more durable. That's a, that's a good thing for patients, but patients do need to get follow-up for their, their breast implants and they need to follow the implant with ultrasound. That's, that's really the preferred technique. And patients do it in the office. It's easy, they're in a familiar location. The compliance and the, and the patient satisfaction with it is so much better than uh, MRI. Uh, it's just, it's night and day. So follow your implants with ultrasound. And that's one of my take home messages for you. I want to just address the, the YouTube question that we got from the patient who said that she never been told she was supposed to get implant surveillance. Obviously I'm not her doctor. I wasn't even there. I don't know what happened. I do think sometimes that happens with patients. And, and the question is, you know, what was given to the patient? Is it something the patient didn't hear, di didn't miss, or um, is it something the patient was just never told? I think these are, these are the type of things that can be worked out with a good, a good process. We talk about the process of different things that we do in plastic surgery, particularly breast surgery. With the process, we want to give patients repetitive information, you know, not only you know, just before the surgery or in their informed consent, but after surgery and continually, because sometimes you need, you know, we're all human. Sometimes you got to hear things a few times to, to really for it to resonate. The, the good thing is, is that an implant rupture is not an emergency. Again, it's, it's relatively infrequent with the newer generation implants, but there's still a lot of women that have older generation implants. There's still women that have newer generation implants that we, we actually identify a, a shell tear, um, but it's not an emergency. And in fact, people have been 
followed for many years. There's a lot of data on this. There's no uh, good scientific evidence to show that there's any real harm of having a ruptured implant. We do recommend somebody that has a ruptured device goes ahead and replaces it. To replace a, a ruptured breast implant is relatively easy. It's a simple surgical procedure, typically if there's no other things going on. There are um, a, a decent percentage of people that have some sort of symptom. Women are usually fairly in tune with their bodies. So usually at the time of having um, something going on with their implant, sometimes people can get things like a change in the shape of the breast. Uh, they can have pain. They can have just that something, they feel something's different about um, the way their breast feels. Uh, and so we usually instruct my patients, if they have any of that, to come call and come in and we evaluate them at that time. And certainly ultrasound is one of the tools that we use to, to evaluate them and incredibly easy uh, to, to image and make a call on a, a ruptured breast implant with ultrasound because it's so dynamic um, and the resolution is so good. And coming full circle, there's 40 million women with breast implants, a lot of people. One of these questions that people have is, what if my implant ruptures? How do I know? So hopefully you found some of this stuff, good full throttle information. But if you like this, check out this implant on why women are downsizing their breast implants.